Uh, thank ahead. you, Mr. Thanks Chairperson, so and uh, on behalf of ILC India, I would like to express my gratitude to ILC Europe for giving us this opportunity. I will be highlighting some of the key studies which were conducted in uh, India. They are not conclusive, but they certainly are indicative of the kind of variability which exists in the country as far as the gut microbiota are concerned. Now, uh, even though the bacteria, beneficial bacteria are there on every possible body surface, most of the research has gone on in relation to the gut microbiota. We have also done certain small studies in relating to vaginal microbiota and we found that uh, the replacing the beneficial bacteria of the vagina, the vagina has gone a long way to reduce a distress, distressing clinical condition called bacterial vaginosis which is prevent, uh, prevalent in India to a great extent. So we will not go into that, we will only look at the gut microbiota. Now, based on the 16S R and RNA, you can actually broadly categorize them into some five major groups of bacteria. I mean, if you look at the kind of uh, bacterial population which have been reported in the guts from different parts of the world, and you find that different kind of bacteria dominate the gut from people coming from different parts of the world. So this indicates is probably it is the kind of food which we eat which decides on the kind of bacteria which exist in our intestines. Mm. Now look at the Asian microbiome, there you see a whole lot of miniature uh, pie diagrams and if you look at the color patterns, you will clearly see a difference in the color pattern between the studies which came from US versus uh, Europe and versus Asia. There are more or less a similar kind of a pattern existing among the various Asian countries. Now in India, the, the challenges for doing this gut microbiome study is India is a highly diverse country with diverse populations, eating very little processed food and mostly home cooked food of different kind of uh, varieties across the uh, country and th therefore that the diversity makes it very difficult to find any kind of a consistency in the bacterial colonies. The studies which I am going to discuss about right now relates to what are the gut bacterial differences between children born by natural vaginal delivery versus those who are born with caesarean. Then with advancing age, is there any difference? Is there any difference between younger people versus older population? The difference between over nutrition and under nutrition, which has been so elegantly already mentioned, and then obesity and malnutrition, and briefly on to clinical conditions called ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Now the, when they compared these children who are born through vaginal birth versus a caesarean, what was found to be interesting was that the, at the day seven after birth, you know that as soon as the baby is born, the first 24 hours the gut is sterile and then only the bacteria start colonizing. At day seven, they found that the children born through Caesarean had very little bifidobacteria, which actually is the most beneficial form of uh, bacteria in the gut. Then we also looked at the background of the children. In a, in a village in South India, they took around 130 healthy children, adolescents and also adults, this is a cross-sectional study. And they found there's a clear difference between the kind of bacteria which is present among children and adolescents versus those present in adults, even though they were consuming the same kind of food. There was also a study which compared two Indian joint families. You know, in India, we have joint families where three to four generations live together. Mm -hmm. They eat the same kind of food. So, and then they looked at these different generations. So they had children, they had adults of middle age, they had older people, everybody in the same roof. And still they found that even though they ate the same kind of food, there was a difference in the bacterial population among the younger people compared to the older individuals. So there is an age associated difference in the gut bacterial populations. And uh, 
Yes, and now comes to the issue of comparing the malnourished versus the well-nourished children. And you know that malnutrition is a major problem in India. And the study was done in a district of West Bengal. It's a quite a backward district of West Bengal. And these are the various kind of bacterial population which were isolated from the fecal samples of these children. And if you look at this diagram, you're looking at, for example, Escherichia coli, Streptococcus, Vellonella, Shigella, etc. These are all <coughs> gut bacteria which are potentially pathogenic. The last is the one which refers to the beneficial bacteria. And you find that these purple charts, uh, uh, boxes, refer to the adequately healthy children. These are borderline malnourished and these are severely malnourished. And you find that the harmful bacteria are much more present in these malnourished children than the well-nourished children. And whereas here, if you find all the beneficial bacteria are seen in much significantly large number among the well-nourished. So nutritional status decides on the kind of bacteria which flourish in the gut. One more possibility of this kind of a picture is because the undernourished children are at a greatest, greater uh, risk of developing uh, gastrointestinal disorders. And it is probably because of the recurrent episodes of gastroenteritis, they are harboring more of the negative bacteria. Then iron deficiency is also a problem. A study was done to see whether there is any difference in the bacterial colonies between iron deficient women versus the iron sufficient women. And it was found that there was no such difference. There are however studies which show that when you give iron supplements to women, it alters the gut bacteria because the iron yeah, unabsorbed iron which goes into the large bowel is known to be inimical, inimicable to the bacteria. There are studies which compared obese versus non-obese. The, the key finding among the obese was that the bacteria which are required for generating short chain fatty acids, you know the short chain fatty acids are an outcome of the undigestible carbohydrate fermentation by these beneficial bacteria and short chain fatty acids are required for the gut health. So these bacteria which are re required for the synthesis of short chain fatty acids were found to be less in number in the obese compared to the non-obese individuals. Then of course comes the inflammatory bowel disorders which are Crohn's disease and uh, 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 ulcerative colitis. There is a distinct difference in the gut bacterial population and now but that is later on in several other countries, they are even doing what is called the fecal transplantation where healthy bacteria are transplanted into the gut and this has gone, uh, resulted in remissions in the disease. Now, can dietary interventions alter the gut bacteria? This came out of the internet. There was a key publication published in PNAs in 2010 <coughs> comparing Italian children with African children. We definitely showed totally different kind of a bacterial population between the two and which was related to the kind of food habits in these children. So it is realized that it is diet which is playing a dominant role over ethnicity, or sanitation, hygiene and all other variables as far as the gut bacterial population is concerned. Now this, there, we have sufficient data based on metagenomics. This is done by the gastroenterology department of the Christian Medical College in uh, India. And you find that they, if you see the kind of bacterial populations compared to the Indian versus the American, which is based on public and published data, there are distinct differences. The Firmicutes population is higher here, whereas the bacteroids population is higher among the American uh, data. Then we come to the issue of probiotics. Probiotics by definition are live bacteria, which when given in adequate quantities, confer a health benefit to the consumer and the probiotic industry has been growing considerably. Now this was a study done to see whether administering a probiotic containing dairy product, commercial dairy product to children would reduce the episodes of diarrhea. And this was done in almost 4,000 children, 2,000 received a probiotic drink whereas the others got a ordinary milk and the, it was given for about 12 weeks and they had a follow up for 12 weeks and the result showed that there was a significant decrease in the incidence of diarrhea in these children. So especially community based diarrhea is a very common problem in India and the 
and the, the reduction was equivalent to something like 14 percent was the efficacy of this particular thing. This is one of the first few studies to show that preventive aspect of a probiotic uh, uh, preparation in reducing the diarrhea. So, there are, there are several probiotic strains of India's dairy industry has developed and they are using it in their dairy products. And this is a, these are the various probiotic, the market in India has been growing at almost 25 percent between 2014 expected to grow and the, the several probiotic products around. Now, because of this, uh, we developed a regulatory framework because everybody and everybody was developing probiotic drinks. We didn't even know whether they were genuine, whether they actually had live bacteria or not. And therefore, this regulation was developed by the Indian Council of Medical Research, which is now being followed by the food regulator in India. So, this is based on where the, the identification of the species, the genus, etc. Several in vitro, in vivo studies are required. And if the manufacturer is making a claim, then he has to do a well-designed clinical study. So, these guidelines are of course available on the mm -hmm. website of the ICMR. Thank you very much. This summarizes the various activities in India.